Sí. Soy Javi, Javi Reyes yeah. for our host. Uh, yes, she, our, our stakeholders are here. We're just waiting for a few more members to um, come into the platform. I see Honorable Boshoff okay. is here. Another one should you think we can continue? Let's then uh, take this opportunity to again extend a word of welcome to to all of you, in particular the honorable members uh, of the Select Committee. Uh, we are continuing with our work uh, and uh, uh, then invite if uh, the, the, the stakeholders are here. The next uh, presenter will be Research ICT, uh, which will be led by Dr. Andrew Renz. Senior Associate Researcher at ICT Africa, uh, together with Hanani Shoman. This is the team that will be represent, representing uh, Research ICT Africa. Over to you, uh, Dr. Andrew Grants. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Um, and thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to, to share with you. Um, because I only have a single display, I have to ask, um, is that currently showing my um, slideshow? Yes. Should say AI in the copyright amendment bill. Yes, it does. Excellent. Um, all right, I, I, let me introduce myself and my colleague briefly, and then um, Mr. Slomani will uh, handle the first few slides. Uh, so I'm uh, originally a lawyer by training. I have a doctorate um, from Duke Law School in the United States, where I uh, um, did research on copyright uh, in the comparing the South African and US systems. I um, also, Moonlight as a software lawyer, uh, dealing with software licensing across borders and um, from various jurisdictions around the world, including South Africa. Uh, Mr. Kamani um, is a researcher with me at Research ICT Africa, where together we're looking at a whole host of things that are not necessarily intellectual property, uh, although that's my original training. In particular, we're looking at how to regulate AI. So AI, um, as he will explain, is quite a new technology. This issue around copyright and AI is actually just the beginning. There's going to be, honorable members, a whole lot more legal issues with AI that you're going to have to deal with at some time in probably the near future. Uh, so without more ado, uh, I believe he's here. Uh, Hanani, can you take it away? Can you talk about the next slide? Sure. Um, thanks, Andrew. And good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, honorable members and everybody else in the room. Um, I'm just going to walk you guys through the basics of, um, you know, why we need to be concerned about AI in light of the Copyright Amendment Act. And just basically walk you through what the technology does and what the implications of this are on copyright. So um, as you see in this particular slide, um, and as Dr. Andrew Renz has already said, that AI is slowly starting to establish itself and entrenching itself in quite a number of different um, fields of practice and different industries. And so we selected just a few of these um, particular examples that uh, rely quite a bit on AI and are proving to be quite um, helpful in the execution of various duties within these um, different um, disciplines. Just, so we just, looked at- just, just, My apology, um, uh, uh, Romani, what oh, is, 
what is OI, AI? Before you go right. any further. <laughs> apologies, apologies. Yeah, yeah, Lucy, yeah, Lucy. Um, <laughs> um, Andrew, if you could go back to the slide, sorry. Okay, so um, just um, for those who do not know yet, um, AI, I'm referring to artificial intelligence, oh. right? And um, so in this particular instance, um, there are different types of artificial intelligence, um, but we will be focusing predominantly on one as we go forward. But just to give you a picture that in this particular instance, um, artificial intelligence as a whole has been used in protein structure prediction for drug discovery. Having just um, you know gotten out of, I, I hesitate to say gotten out, but you know gotten out of a pandemic, uh, the use Recording of artificial in intelligence progress. was uh, very instrumental in um, finding a vaccine in record time. Uh, we also have seen AI being used for medical image analysis, um, largely owing to the fact that human limitations are only, I mean, we're only limited to what limits us as humans. And sometimes we might not be able to see the deeper underlying things. And so artificial intelligence is quite instrumental in that. Um, automated translation, fraud detection, image recognition of defects in manufacturing, predictive maintenance, supply chain demand forecasting. Those are just some of the uses in which artificial intelligence has been used. And that um, certain areas that where artificial intelligence can actually be more instrumental going forward. Uh, next slide, Andrew. So um, when we speak of artificial intelligence in the context of copyright, we are particularly interested in copyright and machine learning. Now, what we, re what we mean by machine learning is that, well, it's quite literal actually, that you are teaching a machine how to do something, right? So in this particular slide, we outlined the three main processes that are involved when we're talking about how AI works. So first of all, you need to provide the AI with input data. What we refer to input data is, imagine we're talking about a human being, right? So the input data in this instance would be feeding the human being with dozens and dozens of books from which to read, from which to learn from, and from which to eventually produce some outputs. So with machine learning and artificial intelligence, it's pretty much the same. In order for it to do something, it needs to be provided with lots of learning materials. And in this particular instance, this is what we call the input data. Now, this can be texts, this can be images, this can be recorded sounds, this can be anything really. But in order for the artificial intelligence to work, it has to be fed some sort of input data. The second stage of that, once you have given it enough data to you know, learn from, you then give it prompts. Now, a prompt is basically an instruction. This is where you tell it what to do based on what it has learned from the input, you, this is where you tell it what to do. So it can be a simple instruction. For instance, um, I'm sure many of us have heard, you know, in the news lately, um, this particular artificial intelligence called ChatGPT. So for in, using that as an example, when we're talking about using ChatGPT, a good prompt would be to say to it, please draft a letter to parliament asking for calculators. Silly example, but I'll just use that as the example. In that particular instance, you are prompting it to go back to all the input data that it has and to, you know, sort of skim around all the data that it has and then give us an output that responds to the prompt that has been given to it. Now it has to give us an answer on what it, what is most likely to be the outcome if we talk about drafting a letter requesting calculators. Now that is the output. The output is basically following the prompt and based on the input data. Now make no mistake, artificial intelligence is not creative. So, you know, for those people that are very scared that artificial intelligence will take over from humans or will supersede us, you can rest assured that that is not how artificial intelligence works. It produces its outputs based on probability of certain things happening in sequence. So for instance, if we're talking about ChatGPT, if I were to say draft a letter, 
to parliament requesting calculators. The chat GPT is not thinking and you know, coming up with the letter for itself. It goes back to the input data. It looks for where inst it looks for instances where somebody has written a letter and what that letter looks like. And so when it gives us an output, it is basically just using probability to say this word usually comes after this word. And in that way, you get an output, which in most instances looks like it's very creative, very intelligent, but in actual fact, it's just propagation. So here's an example. Um, this particular image here um, comes from a, an artificial intelligence application called DALI. Now, DALI produces images based on prompts or instructions. In this particular instance, we gave it the instruction to give us an image on an expert who is explaining AI copyright to parliament, right? So this image is not actually a real person. This image does not exist. This was generated by artificial intelligence. So for people in South Africa and for Africa at large, we have a problem here. First of all, when we say, give us an expert, the artificial intelligence has been trained on data that says that an expert is a white man with a hat. That's what artificial intelligence thinks an expert looks like. And when we say it must explain, it must explain copyright to parliament, the training data that has been fed to it seems to suggest that for, for artificial intelligence, parliament looks like the building behind it, which looks like I think um, the parliament building in the US now, the language on the paper itself is really made up. I can't even make it out myself. But for legislators in South Africa, this should be ringing some sort of red flags to say, why is artificial intelligence only recognizing this particular kind of person as an expert? And why is it only referring to that kind of building as what parliament should look like? So um, as I've already said, um, you know, using the example of ChatGPT. No, you can go ahead and to the next slide. Um, ChatGPT is a kind of large language model, right? So it is trained using millions of inputs. Most of it is from the internet and it's, it's English-based texts. So when the algorithm is fed new data, you know, a, a text or prompt, you know, it predicts the next word and the next. I think I've already explained this in quite some detail. Um, to the next slide, Andrew. So for copyright, what does this mean, right? We have these particular processes in um, the AI life cycle, so to speak. So the corpus compilation. So when I'm talking about corpus in this particular instance, I'm basically referring to a body, right? A body of knowledge, a body of books, a body, a body of texts or images or that kind of thing. So in order to feed AI, input data, we need to compile a lot of texts, for instance. Now for copyright, the question then is when we make these compilations, first of all, are these compilations sourced, you know, are they open source or do they come from publicly available materials? If not, have we actually reached out to the copyright holders to ask them if we can use, if we can use these works for AI training, right? So the question is, is this a reproduction or is it a temporary copy? And then when we talk about technical pre-processing, right, we're talking about putting these different texts into various subfolders, into various, you know, um, categories. Can we call that a reproduction for the purposes of copyright? And then for annotation, it's pretty much the same when we're trying to pick out what this one particularly relates. Mr. Soman, you can't hear you. Dr. Renz, 
Yes, I think I'll take over at this point and um, can uh, rejoin my colleagues. Uh, I'm also aware of uh, time. So basically, you get a, a lot of items together, let's say they're photographs, that's corpus compilation, that involves making at least a temporary copy. Then you process them through some technical process, that's again, maybe reproduction for copyright purposes. You annotate them, so you mark them up because you want to train the AI to do something. Let's say recognize a particular kind of cattle. Um, then you Sorry, throw I'm... out things. Should I just carry on? Uh, um, no, I was just going on to the to the question. Sorry, load shedding just okay. got me in the middle of the presentation. All right, so, 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 um, so shall you go on to the questions. Okay, so um, I was just going to leave you with these three questions, which are very pertinent for copyright. So the first question is, when we're talking about training the data for algorithms, does this infringe on the copyright in the individual items that we put in the training body or the training corpus? Um, as I've already said, did we get permission from the copyright holders in order to train AI? Or if it's from the, if it's open source, then of course it's not going to um, be infringing. Right. The second question is, do the outputs infringe copyright in individual items in the training corpus? Having already said that um, the outputs resembles in one way or the other certain works from that already existing, should we actually be thinking about whether this infringes in copyright in any way? And the output itself, does it actually infringe on copyright? So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Andrew to walk you through the answer to these questions as the law stands at the moment. And then also maybe to walk you through some of the suggestions that we have for the copyright amendment bill going forward. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you. So, so what we have is a situation though, let's say I'm training an AI to recognize a particular kind of cattle or even individual uh, um, uh, cows, then I've used thousands or hundreds of thousands, 500,000 photographs of cattle perhaps to train my, my AI. And now we ask, does my use to train the algorithm infringe copyright in those pictures of cows? Now remember these, these pictures could be of animals that were sold on auction and those animals are now dead. It could be a prize winning photograph by an artist. That's one in a hundred thousand. Most of them are mundane images. It would just take in a um, cattle or, or whatever we're identifying cars. And most of them weren't made to be sold as art. They were just taken um, in passing. So does it infringe? So the answer actually is it's not clear in our law. But because it's temporary, because it's used by a machine rather than um, by human, it's certainly not undercutting the market for that, um, that thing. So maybe it's a trivial use. You make a copy briefly that only a computer sees as it scrapes it off the internet and it keeps it while it's training the AI and it throws it away because there's no point. It wants the algorithm at the end, not a database of pictures. Um, so maybe, but we suggest based on our research that South African law should very clearly allow that because we're, unless we allow that, we won't have African AI. Copyright law in South Africa will just affect cop, you know, AI produced in South Africa. So the rest of the world will carry on producing it. Um, but what will stop is South Africa developing AI capacity. Second question, do the outputs infringe copyright in individual items in the training corpus? So. Will, it, will the, the algorithm occasionally reproduce something that looks a lot like one of the training inputs? And the people who've researched this AI researchers say it, it statistically does happen, but it's very, very rare. But when it happens, we have an answer, right? If I reproduce something without permission, if it doesn't fall in an exception, then I'm infringing and someone can sue me. Um, so we don't need to change the law on that. Um, so it's very, very rare, and we don't need to deal with any further because existing law says, well, if you infringe, then you, you, know, you have a problem. Does the output have copyright itself? So some of the uh, algorithms produce something like um, an identification. That is a cow, or maybe even that's those are in Guni cattle, or maybe even that's a specific 
um, disease that the cow has, but others produce pictures. And so Dial E doesn't just produce pictures of a specific thing, white guys in hats. It produces whatever picture it comes up with when you give it a prompt. Similarly, ChatGPT produces an essay um, in response to your prompt. So should that thing, that essay, that photograph, that thing that looks like a human communication, should that be under copyright? And the law is unclear. As the legislation currently stands, probably not. It, in, South, in the United States, the uh, Registrar of Copyright, who is attached to Congress, has refused to register AI produced works. We don't have someone to make that kind of call in South Africa. That's why Parliament has to make that kind of call. And that's why we're suggesting to you that the Copyright Amendment Bill should contain a provision that says, don't give copyright to AI produced works. Why? Well, as you know, copyrights intended and sent to human beings to create text, images, videos, and software. AI doesn't need copyright as an incentive to produce hundreds or even hundreds of thousands of outputs. So in July 2019, Microsoft invested a billion dollars in OpenAI, which produces a uh, chat GPT. And then in January this year, they put another 10 billion in. So there's the, the, there's not, they don't need copyright as an incentive. Second, or well, third, AI processes do not resemble human creative processes at all. They're probab probabilistic. So they've attached weights to what should come next, given what has come before. Um, and that's not how humans create. Most AI systems that are used to generate creative outputs were trained on very large numbers of human creative outputs, inputs. So while we might say that we don't think it should be infringing, we certainly have to ask ourselves whether it's legitimate that uh, whoever produces those AI outputs should in turn get copyright and then compete with the people who produce the inputs. And so AI systems that produce outputs that mimic the creative inputs, so not all AI systems do that, they risk un undercutting the ability of artists to generate earnings. So for example, in the video game world, right now you have to pay an artist to make art for your video game. And lots of people have. Um, but if there's copyright in AI generated art for video games, then people who make video games who will have copyright in a video game will be able to do without those artists. You can imagine, given how the world's set up, that the people who will suffer most will be people who have limited online access, artists who are at the margins, um, so in other words, South Africans, and the people who will benefit the most from giving copyright in AI art are big tech companies. So. Our recommendation is amend the 1978 Act to clarify that there's no copyright in AI outputs. But this technology is developing very rapidly. So if I were to say to you, let's say large language models or machine learning doesn't result in copyright, that's going to create a major trap because that legislation is going to be outdated. Uh, large language models were not the important AI technology last year this time. Um, the tech's gonna change very quickly. And if we just come up with some tech definitions, um, then that's gonna be dated. So instead, what's the essential point? The essential point is that copyright must only reward human creativity. The result of a human author's skill, skill effort and creativity you mustn't reward machine production. And for text, images, music, software, and audiovisual works, we must make it clear that authors must be human authors. So there's already a push and attempt to claim that an AI can be an author. And this then would mean that whoever owns the AI is gonna have the, the, uh, the results, but why not just say that the person who owns the AI is the author? Well, obviously there are other things at work where people want to be able to say, well, I, I own the copyright, but I'm not responsible for what the AI said when it defamed you. So it's, it's problematic, but we can deal with it and we can deal with it without tying ourselves to a technical, technological definition. Um, we can instead make it clear 
if a human author uses AI to produce something and they remix it and you know take it as a, a first draft and, and in, use skill, effort, and creativity, then we can make it clear that those parts that come from the human author, their skill, effort, and creativity are copyright. So it even enables us to deal with people using AI to create. So our recommendation is to insert a new subsection in section 2A. Section 2A deals with which things are copyright and which are not in the uh, copyright amendment bill. This subsection would read, um, copyright extends only to the products of a natural person's skill, effort, and creativity. And then just to try and guide the courts in any dispute concerning copyright or author's rights, so those are the rights of an author to be named as the author of a work, the author or their successor shall bear the onus of proving that a disputed work or aspect of a work is the product of the skill, effort, or creativity of the author. Well, that just follows logically, right? If we say that only human skill, effort, and creativity result in copyright, then the person who knows, you know, whether there was human skill, effort, and creativity is the author. The rest of us don't know. So they must logically have the, um, the onus. Second, uh, the, we might see a claim that just sort of putting a whole lot of AI, you know, images together or, you know, running an algorithm on the AI images constitutes creativity. And I think that should be prevented. So that's um, who we think that should be prevented because we think we need to see genuine human skill, effort, and creativity. We also suggest we amend the definition of author in section one. So uh, I put in red where I think we should insert natural person. So author in relation to a literary musical artistic work means the natural person who makes the work. So these are, by the way, not in the cab, but this definition of author is in the current um, act, in the 78 act. So wherever it says person who makes a photograph, a sound recording, a film, um, a literary or dramatic uh, work or a computer program, then it must be the natural person um, who made that thing. Our second point is we want to enable AI research. So despite the misgivings and the concern that we should not award copyright to AI, we also shouldn't stifle AI. So we're suggesting a balanced approach in which we refuse copyright for AI productions, but that we allow AI research um, and that copyright law must be amended accordingly. So AI is a strategic technology. If we don't do it, then we'll be reliant on other countries that do create it. It's the next big computing technology. Many, some people have likened it to the internet and the likely change it's gonna have. Big tech companies don't need a copyright exception. And they have millions of our images and texts that they can already use under their terms and conditions. People have been uploading their photographs, writing things, they already have power over that under the terms and conditions that people didn't read. Um, big tech doesn't need copyright anyway because they're intent on creating something called general purpose AI. They want an AI that they can turn to any purpose. Half the time that purpose doesn't need to result in copyright. So we recommend that there should be a right to, to oh, we, we, um, following this is also a right to research under section 61D of the Bill of Rights, which reads, everyone has the right to freedom of expression, which includes academic freedom and freedom of scientific research. And if copyright is interpreted to restrict the right to use inputs for what we call computational analysis, so text mining, data mining, and AI research, so uh, Professor uh, Beiter mentioned this computational analysis early, but he focused on text mining and data mining, but it, it could include AI research. Then we could have another constitutional court case claiming that the Copyright Act is unconstitutional. So the blind essay judgment, which many people have mentioned today, found the current act is unconstitutional. So while people might argue about which aspects of the CAB may or may not be constitutional, there is a clear finding that the 78 Act is unconstitutional. And um, it's, there are probably a number more provisions in which it's unconstitutional, which is unsurprising since it was passed before the Bill of Rights and in fact reflects very much an apartheid mindset. So what we need is a flexible provision that can balance the different competing interests as technology evolves over time. 
fortunately, the cab already has one. Um, so we could, we need to insert a clear exception for use in computational analysis. That's text, data mining, and training AI. But how? European Union and the UK, United Kingdom have both got narrow, detailed exceptions, but the European Union one is widely acknowledged as just not working. And the UK is already debating how to change their exception. The House of Lords was debating it uh, last month. Meanwhile, the United States has fair use. Fair use it permits most, but not all, computational analysis. And the United States, not coincidentally, leads the world in AI. So our recommendation is keep Section 12A in the Copyright Amendment Bill, but include the words computational analysis as part of research. So it would read like this. In addition to uses specifically authorized, fair use in respect of a work or the performance of that work for purposes such as the following does not infringe copyright network, research, including informational analysis, private study or personal use. So that's our um, formal recommendations and um, I'm very happy uh, to answer any questions, respond to any concerns the committee might have. Um, there have at times in the past been claims that academics are um, sponsored by various technology companies. I must make clear the funding for this research is taxpayer money, not South African taxpayer money. It's actually the Canadian Development uh, um, Council, which uh, has funded this research. And so therefore, if I might um, take any questions, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Andrew and uh, Mr. Kamani uh, for taking us through the, the uh, presentation which uh, mainly centered around uh, uh, the uh, very interesting topic. Uh, so let's 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 check with members if they have any questions in relation to, to uh, <clears throat> the presentation. Uh, I think what is quite critical is uh, is the uh, points that you have raised around uh, uh, some of the suggestions that you need, that, that you made around uh, keeping section twelve a, but. Uh, uh, definition on computational analysis. I think that was quite uh, uh, categorical, but also the comparative analysis that you have made in regard to to uh, the situation in uh, EU UK, uh, the the difference in terms of fair use. Uh, <clears throat> I think. Uh, Key to that are those three questions that you, that that, uh, that 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 were raised. Uh, uh, did we get permission uh, to produce uh, artificial intelligence uh, through the inputs to, uh, that you made? Uh, does the output infringe copyright? Does the output have copyright? I think those are clear uh, messages that are that are emerging, but also the insertion around. Uh, Around uh, uh, <clears throat> section two A, three A, B, and C, those were quite uh, categorical in terms of, of, of your input, uh, uh, <clears throat> but also the human creating, uh, human creating, and not machine, not machine production. Uh, I, you draw a distinction between the two, which is quite which is quite exciting. Uh, uh, <clears throat> but in, in, in a nutshell, in a nutshell uh, the, the sense that I get is that uh, there's no position to, 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 the, to the bill, but there are a number of concrete uh, suggestions that we are making in relation to the artificial intelligence. Did I capture you correctly, Dr. Andrew? Uh, yes, um, so full disclosure, I, uh, because of, uh, his, I've historically been part of the um, academic team that presented this morning, uh, Dr. Santami, I, I did uh, co-sign that document just, just as I co-signed two previous uh, opinions by that group of people. 
but this research is that I've presented to you now is Research ICT Africa's and Research ICT Africa does not um, oppose any aspect of the bill, but suggests that these discrete um, uh, changes be made in response to this problem of AI. And, and let me just add, this problem of AI didn't even exist really. Uh, e even people like me who do this research weren't aware of this at the time the bill was first drafted. This was not on the horizon. So we have an opportunity to like move quite quickly on something that otherwise, if the bill had gone through, uh, we wouldn't be able to do. So let's take advantage of this like, sort of moment in time. Brilliant, 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 Dr. Andrews. I think uh, it's, it's, it's a learning curve. <laughs> it's a learning curve. Uh, let me take this opportunity on behalf of the Select Committee to indeed express a word of gratitude uh, to the team uh, led by you and Mr. Shomani for the presentation that we have made. Uh, indeed, uh, it will help us in moving forward in terms of processing uh, various views and, uh, uh, and di di diversion views that were expressed throughout the last uh, two. And this is the third uh, round of public hearing. Thank you, Dr. Andrew. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Have a, wonder, have a wonderful afternoon for two. Thank you. So much. Uh, the next uh, round uh, of presentation uh, uh, will be the gender equity unit from the University of Western Cape, uh, which will be led by uh, Dr. Fikile Bilagasi, um, uh, uh, Pumza Jack from West of Azania and um, uh, uh, Macapella. Uh, let me give over to the team uh, to, to present to the committee. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, for giving us this opportunity to present to the committee. Um, I will hand over to Dimpo, who is going to be our first presenter, and each of us will introduce ourselves as we do so, Chair. Thank you so much. Over to you, Dimpo. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Fikile. Um, I'm not too sure if the presentations are going to go up or if I should. Okay. All right. Okay. So I will be speaking um, to the first three slides. Um, after the, the introductory slide. Um, so I am Dimpo Makabella from the Gender Equity Unit Department. Um, I am the Student Projects Officer and uh, my programs focus specifically on the volunteer programs that we have on offer at the department. Uh, what I would like to start with is um, our department. So just giving you background information as well as where we are located within the University of the Western Cape. We were established in 1993 by the late Rhoda Kadali with the assistance of the Ford Foundation. The department currently resides under the Deputy Vice Chancellor of the Research and Innovation um, since the year 2015. So the Gender Equity Unit is guided by institutional, national, and international policies, guidelines, and conventions. The University of the Western Cape's mission is to establish itself as a research-led university responsive to the needs of a constantly changing world through excellence in learning, teaching, and research, and the generation and application of new knowledge. Um, firmly anchored in its local and sub-regional context and inspired by its distinctive academic role in building a more equitable and dynamic society, the university continues to empower its students, staff, and partners to advance its mission of serving the greater public good and, and searching for humane and sustainable solutions to the challenges of our time. This is pursued through high academic standards, intellectual rigor and productive partnerships and networks beyond the confines of disciplinary and geographic boundaries. Our mission as the Gender Equity Unit is to support the university in its mission by promoting women and gender equity and social justice through feminist research, education and advocacy in the university and beyond. It is this mission that we as the Gender Equity Unit will affirm our position in feminist intellectual activism and capacitating societies towards ensuring equity in all spheres of life. 
So if we can move on to the next slide, where we will look at the gender equity unit strategic priorities, which are to ensure that we promote equity foster, um, equity foster social inclusion and facilitate the transformation. And this is done through governance, where we provide leadership oversight for the coordination of policy coherence and accountability through research which strengthens institutional response to equity, social inclusion and transformation by conducting ongoing evidence-based studies and producing scholarships on these topics. Lastly, our programs that through their interventions enhance institutional culture in alignment with equity, social inclusion and transformation. Through COVID-19 and the lockdown that occurred in 2020, the programs had to explore digital means to fulfill their mandate of accessing and providing educational awareness on issues concerning women, gender and sexuality, disability, food insecurity, youth advocacy, and critical creative expressions. On to the next slide, where we look at the principle of fair use. Um, oh, the next slide. <laughs> yeah, those are just our programs that we offer at our department in alignment to the sustainable development goals. Um, so now the position of the gender equity unit in the amendment bill debate is that we are an academic institution that supports access to information for students and academics. I, I, I just want to speak out. Um, my, my apology, uh, uh, my dear. Can you mute? My, my apologies, my apologies. Thanks. You can continue, uh, uh, Ms. Macapella. All right, no problem. Thank you. Um, now, the position of the gender equity unit in the amendment bill debate is that we are an academic institution that supports access to information for students and academics and those who have a footprint on our premises. Fair use exercise with a sense, with a sense of consent and dialogue will ensure that we can share information with students, academics, and members of society in ways that promote academic and intellectual freedoms, which promotes innovation, social inclusion, transformation, and equity. We are wary of how capitalist systems seek to prohibit this possibility by speaking against the principle of fair use and defending ways that seek to exploit the knowledge of creators for profit and not for purpose where, we, where one seeks to achieve goals where education and knowledge production is concerned. We firmly stand against greed and austerity measures that are fixated on prioritizing profit over possibilities that could provide educational and educational and advocacy benefits to society. We live by the principle of generosity in knowledge production and a dignified approach to generosity, which speaks to our sense of humanity. It is our firm conviction that if this bill is passed into law, it will contribute towards a more humane society that is deeply embedded in these values of our democratic dispensation as enshrined in the section nine of the Bill of Rights, which speaks to unfair um, discrimination where certain individuals or organizations will not necessarily have financial infrastructure to access certain materials specifically for educational research and advocacy purposes. The principle of retrospective compensation under the same breath, our position in the principle of retrospective compensation, we acknowledge that our students, activists and intellectual artivists constantly create content that we use in our programmatic offerings, such as our Violence Against Women educational program, EduDrama in its various productions performed at the National Arts Festival, our Gender and Sexuality Advocacy program, Loud Enough in the digital documentation of a personal journey and advocacy work, our youth advocacy program, the mentoring program, navigating the lived realities of learners in the Cape Flats, and lastly, our alternative and critical expression program in Beirut through various mediums of expression, question, um, expression, questions, issues within the university and beyond. Their contribution often goes about uncompensated where royalties are concerned. You could say to some degree, we practice fair use. As mentioned earlier, artists, creatives, and artivists are navigating, if not dying in poverty, 
and as a department addressing issues of equity and social justice, we guard against the exploitation of artists and creators in this regard and their related generations. For this reason, we firmly support the compensation of the work of creation by artists and intellectual activists and artivists, even as they moved on with their lives from creative output or projects. They should be compensated where needed retrospectively um, to recognize their dignity, ensure equity, and enable justice. We believe that Section 6A of the Copyright Amendment Bill addresses a share in royalties regarding literary works, musical works, and artistic works. It has been mentioned by previous speakers who had made emphasis on the socioeconomic realities and considerations with regard to the fair, to fair use and compensation. We do take a stance that consensual, dignified fair use on the terms and conditions of the artist, creatives, intellect should always be considered, especially where areas of education, research, and knowledge production is concerned to ensure that knowledge production is always equitable and not exploitative in approach. And I end there. Hand over to my colleague. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I will, um, I, will, I will move on from there just to speak on behalf of Ikelo Healers Collective, who is a partner organization with the, the Gender Equity Unit at the University of the Western Cape. Um, who is Ikelo in this debate? Ikelo Healers was started in 2020 as a, you know, in response to engaging on the needs and the rights of indigenous knowledge holders and healers from varied uh, healing paradigms during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and, and of course, we're doing this work beyond that. Uh, we are a collective of knowledge holders who come from different formations of traditional healers, cannabis growers, um, herbalists, Reiki practitioners, nutritionists, Ayurvedists, diviners, and artists who identify as healers. And our vision is really that of a world that is healed away from embracing uh, varied healing paradigms in this 21st century that we live in and, and, and beyond. And of course, uh, as a way of freeing ourselves and all of us from this woundedness that has resulted from systems of oppression um, during slavery, colonization and apartheid. And it is our mission uh, chair, to heal ourselves and our families and our communities in our nations, in our continents, and the world at large, through remembering who we are um, in our interconnectedness and in our relationship with the, the natural world, Mother Earth, varied horizons, and each other. Um, the next slide, please. So as we, we then embrace, come from that positionality, uh, we want to contextualize in this debate our argument in terms of copyright law. And our argument is that in South Africa, we have copyright law that is outdated and it no longer really serves um, you know, the needs of creations as we have beautifully articulated for the rest of the day, and no longer relevant because it carries this deep and violent history of slavery, colonization and apartheid, and therefore does not represent the aspirations um, of a democratic dispensation as enshrined in the constitution of the Republic. So we believe that South Africa has a responsibility chair to part ways with this violent colonial and apartheid legislative framework you know, in this era, whose aim really has been to subjugate and exploit creations um, and knowledges of different kinds. Of those people like some of us here who have been seen as unequal than other, less than human and therefore second class citizens, most of whom, as we know, chair are black, African, women, Izangoma, Izinyanga, Amakeja, diviners, seers, light workers, and healers, often referred out of context, really, by colonial legislation as witches. You know, indigenous people, domestic workers, and LGBTQI persons, amongst others. So we have seen how the creative industry, for example, and, and related protections continue to benefit former colonial masters and their entourage in the manner in which big business like publishers, your pharmaceutical companies, recording companies, uh, amongst others, and multinational corporations, uh, most of whom are, are white male, uh, and the former colonizers, as we know, have continued to exploit and from this skewed copyright legislation, not just in South Africa, but all over the world, um, in, in, you know, in their favor, because that is precisely what colonization was about. And what we see also now in this 21st century, a new coloniality continues to be about. And, and that is the context in which we come from, Chair. Uh, the next slide, please. 
So in this context, then we continue to support fair use in the manner that it stands in this bill, because in our view, it embeds uh, the principle of Ubuntu. In our view, the principle of fair use really um, will benefit varied works of creations by indigenous knowledge holders who are part of our constituency, um, who, whose fundamental practice is that whatever our ancestors and our ancestresses um, have given to us as gifts or, or works of creations and knowledges are really first and foremost for sharing with humanity and the natural world for purposes of love and healing as we can benefit you know, from it ourselves. So this is the cycle of life that we, we firmly believe exists for all of us uh, in that which is gifted by, by, by the goddesses uh, of different kinds, the gods and the celestial beings that uh, we draw our sources from. And, and this is something that we believe has to be shared fairly um, and, and in some instances freely in order to return back to the cycle of living and livelihood and being who we are as humans. And this is embedded in this philosophical uh, belief of being Abandu, really embedded in a century long practice, even more than that, of Ubuntu, which embraces the practices and values of sharing, where simply we say, Che uh, Ubuntu, Ubuntu Abandu. Uh, translated in English, as we all know, you are because we are, I am because you are. And the principle of fair use, as we see it in this bill, is simply about the promotion of Ubuntu. To enable access to information, uh, content, stories, creations, visions, and dreams in ways that can only enhance our humanity as a people. Um, noting that these works of creations are meant to heal all of us, uh, Che, those who receive them from voices of reason and those who share them. Uh, for general use and for goodness of humanity um, really are, are given for that purpose of healing. So we firmly believe that the principle of fair use as it stands uh, in some jurisdictions is called fair dealing. It's really uh, meant to simply heal all of us as a nation. And we support the fact that it needs to be applied into law as it is uh, standing currently in the bill. Uh, next slide, please. And just to add, in terms of retrospective compensation, it is our, conversation, our conviction uh, that works of creations have to be compensated in some form for reasons that have been stated already, issues of poverty against creators and, and, and artists and so on, right? As a result, we believe that creators who have been robbed of their royalties over time and over the years must be retrospectively compensated. We have lived for too long with copyright a legislation that has favored those who own the means of production, the capitalists, at the expense of those who do the work, you know. So we have seen how creators have been compensated. That our argument um, of retrospective compensation stands um, in the form of royalties uh, in the manner that the bill is proposing. And that indigenous knowledge fairly shared their patents, their creations, uh, and probably were robbed you know, of their fair share of royalties over time in the process must be compensated. And our view is that as the bill stands um, in these provisions, it will enable that to okay, you know, if it's passed in the manner that it stands and thereby reverse this colonial and apartheid legacies that have been sitting in, the, in copyright uh, policies uh, and law in our statutes for far too long. Um, and the next slide, uh, please. So in Africa, uh, we all know that people's welfare and rights are safeguarded as articulated in the healing wisdom um, of uh, Maladonna practice, Some, You know, welfare and rights of healers uh, or progressive positive traditional indigenous wisdom holders really lie in the ability to explore and use indigenous plants and other medicinal properties and elements of nature and the environment. And in the ancestral realm uh, or celestial realms, nature and human beings intersect. We are interconnected, we coexist and we are interdependent. So such wisdom really is transferred and shared intergenerationally to a, an individual, but also to a community of healers through a journey of various phases. That of unlearning about knowledge, um, you know, which is all the elements of nature really as indicated as plants, water, 
son, F, uh, and, and, and heir. So it involves unlearning these ancestral spiritual uh, links to the, those elements as we have been given and shared to us by the gods and the goddesses of the sun and the water and, and the earth and the air. In Africa, we've got Nom Kubulan. In South Africa, we've got goddess Osun, for example, in the part of the continent, by way of example, uh, is one of the ancestral spirits and principles and goddesses that is linked to water and earth elements because she is a feminine reproductive energy of the life cycle that we are enjoying. And the knowledge holders in our view need to then be protected in this fraternity in that particular way, given the fact that the past 300 years or so or more um, have really exposed um, healers and knowledge creators to, 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 to depths of vulnerability of such knowledges in the name of profit. Right in the name of, of name game. And one example, uh, you know, which is closer home is the rejection of the Madagascar COVID-19 organics as we have seen happening during the COVID-19 pandemic, I think around 2020 and 2021. So what healers uh, knowledge is sacred, Chair, our argument is that it is based on values of sharing. It is based on values of equity, of respect, of reciprocity. Uh, you give and I give, we share. And well-being of elements of the biosphere because the gifts that we receive are meant to heal all of us. Therefore, a copyright amendment must consider these values as core to the knowledge of healers. And it is our conviction, uh, as I go to the next slide, Chair, that this bill as it stands, it really provides that. So we support the urgent passing of the amendment uh, of, of the amended copyright bill of 2017, uh, that is a typo, and, and really to defend Ubuntu Bay too would like to iterate our support of the presentations that were made by a collective of universities this morning under Dr. Samtani. We also really also support the judgment of the Constitutional Court on Blind SA and that of Recreate because we work together in this in this conversation. Uh, Chair, we're not going to repeat what they've said, but our submission uh, supports that as I hand over to our last speaker. Thank you. Over to you, Tilda. Thank you, leadership. Can you share the slide for, for me, please? Can you please move to the next slide? Uh, thank you. Got it. Thank you. Uh, positioning of Voice of Azania in the Copyright Amendment Bill uh, debate. The Voices of Azania was founded by the group of Africans coming from different African countries with the main aim of pushing the pan Africanism the ideology and the vision to, adv to advocate on every aspect that affects our community all across the board. The Voices of Azania would like to submit to the topic of co copyright bill that we want to see legislation that protects the rights of indigenous artwork, relabeling of our traditional medicine, and in particular, the work which is done by South African artists and the expert of indigenous properties. The Voices of Azania would like to support other submissions which were made before us in this regard. Unequivocally, we unashamed believe and inclined towards a pan-Africanism ideology and asserts that South Africa is not an island on its own. As much as the South African government wants to protect non-South African laborers from structural employees and from explo exploitative practices, we then, the Voices of Azania hope that we encourage government will do, will do the same with the copyrights bill in order to protect, to protect the vulnerable upcoming new and the old ones who are often for who are already foreseen for, exploit for exploitation by the third party agreements and policies in respect of you. Next slide, please. The exploitation of South African artists and other people of different creativities, as well as mentioned in the submissions of Recreate must be strongly protected by the legislation in this country and across the continent. We want to see the, the respect of the thesis between big corporates and the vulnerable individual artists 
in general, who, whoever suffers in silence, as we have been witnessing in the case between Vodacom and the South African men who invented the uh, popular please call me, uh, which is used by the general message. The fight has been going on and off, and then it has already took a, taken two decades over the payment or of royalties. We believe that this is not the only case, that just an example. There are other cases that have not been heard or have not came up yet. We are, in great, we are grateful and happy as the Voices of Azania to join thousands of other members and organizations from different aspects of life to give and have hand support to our long time marginalized artists and other who seek the restoration and restoration of uh, justices in terms of a copy rights abused and well established corporate companies. Uh, next one. We agree almost with each and everything. These submissions before us by Recreate and other organization would like to plead with you to change that outdated, apartheid and colonized legislation that intended on the rights of our own imaginalized communities and general artists, engineers, entrepreneurs, and others. We hope you, this act will act in good faith and protect those um, institutions. Thank you very much. I think that is the last one from the Voices of Hazania. Uh, thank you so much, Chair. We are done. Uh, thank you for giving us time to really uh, express this in our own voice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vilagazi, uh, for, for taking us through uh, three sets of uh, presentation. Uh, quite uh, categoric. Uh, any, any questions, honorable members? Uh, I think the, the presentation are quite uh, are quite uh, explicit in terms of uh, its support to the to the to the two bills uh, coming from uh, uh, three three streams that are that are that are interlinked. Uh, uh, the the uh, the uh, class uh, a tempo and emphasis uh, raised by the first presenter, uh, <clears throat> which clearly reiterate the fact that uh, the current the current and copyright bill uh, is outdated. It's uh, it's the legacy of the past, and uh, it serves a particular uh, a class, and therefore. The amendment was supported, uh, particularly giving uh, its, uh, its emphasis on retrospectivity, but also fair use but that uh, cut across the, uh, the second presentation. Uh, <clears throat> and also the voice of Azania. As I said, three uh, presentations that are interlinked, interdependent, and uh, 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 more, 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 more clear. Uh, in the absence of any any questions from the members, uh, let me then take this opportunity on behalf of the select committee uh, to to express a word of gratitude to to the team, uh, Dr. Milagazi, uh, uh, Jim Tom Macapella. Uh, and uh, also our last presenter, uh, <clears throat> putting more emphasis on the on the Azanian taste of the of the fair use and also the copyright. Thank you. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon, Dr. Vilagazi. Any last word? Any last word from you, Dr. Villagazi?
Am I audible? Okay. Madia? Hi, Chen. Oh, uh, I think Grace? she has locked out. Okay. I think she has locked okay. out. All right. Let's then uh, move to our next uh, round of uh, presentation, Grace. Uh, and the next uh, presenter will be will be the Dr. Rechtenpa. Okay, Doctor. Dr. Rechtenpa and, and Dr. and Mr. Oh, brilliant. Uh, on and Mr. Lamini. The... I've already oh. made them a co host. Oh, brilliant, 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 Grace. Let's then uh, allow uh, Dr. Rottenbach uh, to then uh, take the floor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, honorable members. Good afternoon. Um, I would uh, like to start off just uh, by actually running my slides. So just bear with me for a second. Um, hopefully you'd be able to see my screens at the at present. Sorry, Chair. Yes, 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 yes. Let's let, 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 let them help you so that at least your presentation is uh, There we go, Chair. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think, uh, as mentioned, uh, Mr. Lamini, the CEO of Universal Music, will start off just touching on the industry. Um, and then I'll highlight a couple of industry concerns um, from a legal perspective with regards to the Copyright Amendment Bill. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll hand over to my colleague, Mr. Lamini. Um, what to you, Mr. Lamini. You're welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much uh, for the warm welcome. Um, I'd like to just start by saying that the recording industry of South Africa represents approximately 20,000 independent record companies that operate locally, across the continent, and internationally. We've had some amazing moments, some of which were championed by independent artists. For example, Vota Kellerman, who won not only one Grammy, but two Grammys. Then you have the likes of Black Coffee, who also won a Grammy in 2020. And earlier this year with Universal Music South Africa's release, recorded and performed by Zakes Bantrini, Nom Nebo, and Vorotu again, also won a Grammy. The combined efforts and investments of the independent and major labels has resulted in the highest level of international marketing and awareness for South African recording artists. In fact, during the COVID period from 2020 up until 2023, Universal's investment into South African recording artists and label partners has resulted in six South African artists like Durban Gogo and Duduzo Makatini, Casper Nyoves, Black Coffee, Andile Mpisani and Jeremy Loops and Nomfundo Moore having their albums being marketed in Times Square in the heart of New York, USA. Can we move to the next slide, please? Apologies for that, there you go. Thank you very much. So let's just talk about the South African music industry landscape. From the invention of Kwaito to mid-tempo house, to Afro pop, to Gom, to Amapiano, Maskandi, or our very own take on gospel. A large and growing part of music being recorded and released today sees independent labels and artists owning their own masters. South Africa, currently ranks 38 in the International Federation of Recording Labels, top 60 countries in the world. At the end of 2022, South African music industry was experiencing a 30% growth rate. Just to put that into context and compare it to <clears throat> the rest of Africa altogether, while South Africa grew at 30% growth rate, the, the, the combined um, the combined continent excluding South Africa only ranks 50 in the IFPI's top 60 countries where South Africa ranked 30. And in fact, the rest of the continent only generates a third 
of the total revenue generated in South Africa alone. Thank you. Handing back over to you, Pierre. Thank you, sir. Um, and I think this next slide really links with that. Um, and when we're going to talk about, especially uh, one of our colleagues touched on AI earlier, the effect that could potentially have if left unchecked as currently provided for by these amendments of the bill. So if you look at global recorded music industry revenues from 1999 all the way to 2021, um, focus on the red bars. Those indicate physical sales. And as you can see, that's quite a precipitous drop since um, 2000. And the main effect and cause was the advent of digital piracy in the form of MP3s and applications such as Napster. So various other forms of revenue streams have made up for it since. And we're finally at a point where we can say, yes, the industry has recovered to since not taking inflation or anything else into account to where it was in 1999 by uh, factoring streaming revenues, other digital revenues, performance rights and synchronization. So the response um, on, on global revenues, uh, it is a sensitive system in the sense where when something's introduced that affects sales, you can immediately see what, what the effect of that would be. And normally you can only look at revenues. Now, our principal concerns relating to the build, um, I'm, these are by no means inclusive list, but firstly, it would be a failure to conduct an economic impact assessment study. So we're attempting a, a one-size-fits-all sort of take here. Then there's the open-ended exceptions with regards to fair use, and I'll touch on that briefly. Um, and as an example, build on the idea of what the impact of AI and the SA creative industry would be. Then we talk about the powers of the minister to prescribe contractual terms. And then finally, the 25 years reversion of performer consent and copyright. Um, and in quotation marks, I'm scrambling the egg. That will become clear in a second. So when you talk about failure to conduct the economic impact study, the proposed bill, and talking about when I talk about the bill, I'm mainly referring to the Copyright Amendment Bill. Um, the proposed bill compromises South Africa's copyright framework. It's humbly submitted. As drafted, it can be foreseen that the rights of, the, of creative persons will be diminished. So the whole idea is there's incentive to create, there's revenue being generated, and there's reinvestment. So if you have diminished rights, then you'll have a clear impact on the incentive to create and consequently result in less and less investment in current and future artists. The full and eventual effect of these amendments on the industry and South Africa's vibrant creative sectors are yet unknown, hence the importance of a widespread economic impact study. It is thus submitted that the bill as drafted is detrimental to the industry as a whole and a widespread study must consequently be conducted. One example, let's look at fair use and the fair use exception and our principal concerns relating to this. Now, I just want to touch on these various sections. So section 12A, as amended, now introduced a sweeping open-ended US style, style fair use exception. But there are certain conditions that must be looked at when you look at fair use. And I'll touch on them on the next slide. Section 12B1A, as amended, now establishes a quotation exception which is unduly broad and not in compliance with the three-step test, as I'll mention in a second. Then 12B11 and 12B2 sets out private copying exception, which extends to digital stories and fails to ensure fair remuneration for rights holders and artists whose works are being copied. And this is, of course, contrary to international practices. 12B1C retains an unreasonably broad so-called ephemeral exception. So an ephemeral exception, as currently provided for in the Act, allows broadcasters, for instance, to make a temporary copy for up to six months with a license to do so. Now, the new section, section 12B of the Copyright, 12 of the Copyright Act simply apply all the listed exceptions to all works, unlike section 12 of the Act, which only applies to musical and literary works. Um, so if you look at, uh, apologies, um, the four factors of fair use. And look at, just unpack it for a second. Each time any copyrighted content are used under this exception, the following will need to be looked at. The purpose and character of the use, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount or substantiality of the portion used. Was it only a backup singer's track? Was it, uh, was it, was it a so guitar solo? Uh, what's the effect thereof commercially as well? 
and then effect of the use on a potential market for the value of the work. So this can be extremely difficult. Um, for example, as I mentioned, the chorus of the song is often a substantial part of the song. So the amount used might be less meaningful. Um, and US cases have shown this. So they've also struggled to, being again, fair use being a US concept, these cases have struggled to determine conclusively whether and to what extent the market value of, for example, the artistic work, or for that matter, a musical sample is affected. So ultimately the question for the courts will be the following. Uh, what of a self-releasing independent artist who do not have the money to litigate? Um, and if you have to go to the court to determine whether this was indeed fair use and what portion was used and what's the material and market uh, value of that usage, um, these independent artists literally stand no chance against global tech companies. Again, humbly submitted. So fair use is not necessary to drive or sustain innovation. Um, the, the, legitimate la the landing of legitimate digital service providers is a clear example of that. Currently, South Africa has more than 14 digital services which are licensed. Um, and then that brings us to AI. And, and this is very interesting. If You, you can literally recreate um, substantial portions of a recording, including an artist's signature voice, without any material impact on the original work's market value. At least that could be the argument of any such creation. So recreating an artist's voice and other elements to a song, for example, a recording, which are not easily distinguishable from the original, will heavily impact performance rights and, and all these other various elements and, and rights where royalties are attached to. It is submitted thus that this would decimate revenue. So if you have licensing losses due to restaurant use of AI content, which sounds similar or not dissimilar to the original, et cetera, Again, a thorough impact study is needed before we make these sweeping amendments. And this brings us back to that graph I had at the beginning. If something of this were to happen, you could decimate your performance rights element to that graph. And you could decimate numerous other of those additional revenue streams where you're back to something that resembles the physical graph with a precipitous drop. Now, the next point and next concern for us is the power of the minister to prescribe contractual terms. And how this will be done is still a question. But the proposed amendments to Section 39 of the Act provides for broad ministerial powers, thus to prescribe standard contractual terms for agreements to be entered into. So that it's submitted that this would unduly regulate the framework in which the creative industries operate. Um, and what about the independence of parties to freely contract, which will now be regulated, thus resulting in potential unwarranted restrictions, terms and conditions? Uh, again, the implication of this is widespread and, and detrimental to the industry as a whole. So if you look at the proposals to Section 22 of the Copyright Act, um, we're now talking about 25-year revision of performance concept, i.e. the copyright reverts back to the performance. However, as I go through the next couple of slides, and there's just two of them or three of them, it's important to remember that copyright is not only the song itself. There would be rights as assigned to the vocalist, rights assigned to the backup singer, rights assigned to the drumming, the producer, etc. And the royalties are attached to all those rights. So for we copyright in a literary or musical work was assigned by an author shall only be valid for a period of 25 years, which is currently 50, from the date of such assignment. And this is what's provided by the bill. Such a license can be verbal or in writing. Now, the implication of this is clear. Unwarranted and harmful restrictions on the transfer of rights by performers. So reversion of rights will make sound recordings unusable after 25 years. And, and this is not a mere submission. This is the reality of, of what we can expect. Thereby harming the very performer and the proposed proposal purports to protect. So artists generally assign their performance rights to a record company. This, of course, enables the record companies to further license such rights to, for instance, digital services, thereby generating revenues from set recordings. Now, what happens, reversion of these assigned rights to performance after a maximum of 25 years would fragment the rights in the recording itself. This is the unscrambling of the egg, as I mentioned. Now, because the recording is made up of numerous performances, no one would gain anything from the revision of the rights of the, in their performance. The, the actual revenue is attached to the composition consisting of all the rights of the performances. So a performer cannot do anything with their reverted right in their percussion performance, for instance, on a track that comprises, for example, other performances by backing singers, keyboard players, drummers, etc. These rights on their own cannot be licensed with all the other rights of the other performers 
and of the record company. So the sole effect of reversion would be the following. The rights in the recording are fragmented between the record company, which owns the copyright and the sound recording, and the various performers, which now own their rights and their own contribution to the overall track, with no party able to license or derive revenues from their individual rights. Therefore, unless the following, unless following the revision of rights, the record company can secure new assignments or exclusive licenses from each of the performance of a track, the track can be used by anyone. Now, what happens if the drummer doesn't want to reassign his rights? Now, the inability of the record company to regain their reverted rights from just one performer would mean the track cannot be licensed to, for example, a digital music service provider because the use would infringe the drummer's reverted rights, even if all the other rights had been reassigned back to the record company. This is the effect with the revision clauses. Um, at the end of the day, the vast catalog of recorded music will fail without circula will fall out of circulation because it simply cannot be used without infringing one or more parties' rights. In effect, the period that sound recording can generate revenue for producers and performance will also be halved uh, from the current 50 year to the new maximum of 25 years, and nothing beyond that is submitted. Reversion of rights would have a direct negative effect on investment in South African artists. Um, I've raced through this, mindful also how late it is in the afternoon for everyone, but this, again, by no means it's an exhaustive list, and, and we're really grateful for being able to, to make these submissions today, Chair, Honourable Members, and we do thank you for your time, and, and again, this opportunity, and, and we hope that this would further dialogue, and, and that uh, we can reach consensus, and, and something that works for the industry performance and everyone concerned. So thank you for that. Um, and and I, I, I'll hand over for any questions or comments. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Rottenberg. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> Mr. Damini for that. Any question, members? Uh, from my side, just... Uh, a slide before the last one, uh, the one that speaks about uh, 25 year reversion, uh, uh, and also the, 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 the fragmentation of performance rights, uh, because there are numerous performer and performance in, uh, in the recording uh, track. Uh, you allude to the point that uh, uh, this will be meaningless unless a new assignment or an exclusive uh, an exclusive license uh, is uh, obtained. How difficult would it be for a new assignment or an exclusive license to be? Is it something that uh, is deemed to, to, to be insurmountable? Well, is it something that is far-fetched or is it something that is doable? That's just, just for an understanding. Uh, hi, um, Pierre, would you like me to answer that or do you want to go ahead? Yes. No, no, I, 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 please go I, ahead. Okay. Yes. Well, and, okay. Uh, yes, you can ask a Thanks, question. And yeah, sure. So, so it would be very complicated to achieve that, Chair, because Imagine in the in the unfortunate scenario that one of those um, performers or those members has passed on, and is or has moved to another country and is no longer living in South Africa. Maybe has relocated. It means that being able to um, fully commercialize that work would be paused until either the surviving estate is contactable and goes through the process of approving or agreeing to the terms, or if that is impossible to locate that person or the estate, it means that it stops being commercialized. If those oh. rights cease to be um, exploitable because just one member, so you might have, you might have a, a song that has four people writing and one person performing. If at the time of renewal or the time of expiration, you cannot contact, and contract with all people, then you cannot continue to exploit that work. Furthermore, if one of those people becomes a hostile negotiator and makes an unreasonable demand, 
it stops the ability for everybody else to also be able to benefit com commercially. Okay, Mr. Tamir. Uh, I think it's quite uh, uh, clear uh, what I just wanted to, to get a sense uh, what could be the complications around that. But I think you have adequately responded to my question. Uh, let me then take this opportunity on behalf of the Select Committee to, to extend a word of gratitude to, to the team, uh, Mr. Lamini and Mr. Rottenbach. Rottenbach for the Rottenbach for the opportunity that you grabbed in terms of the invite that we made to the public to help us in terms of processing this bill. Indeed, uh, yeah, your input will help us a great deal in terms of understanding uh, how to move forward. Uh, and indeed, a uh, word of gratitude again. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon as we proceed. Any last word, uh, Tim? Uh, just thank you very much, Shane, also for including us in this process. It's, it's a privilege. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Peter. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you for coming. So, uh, Grace, the next uh, presenter. The next presenter is uh, uh, Net. Is it Netflix? Just want to confirm. Yes, it will be Netflix. Uh, led by Siyanda Butelezi Ngobo, uh, the manager of Sub-Saharan Africa, and also uh, Bradley Silva, the head of the intellectual property of Netflix. Over to the team. Good afternoon, Chair. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Again, my name is Zianta Butelezi Ngobo. I'm the country lead for public policy for Netflix. Uh, this afternoon with me is Bradley Silva, who is head of our IP uh, policy team. We're very grateful for the opportunity to be here and to participate in this policy um, dialogue. And we sincerely hope that at the end of the process, we're able to come up with the legislation that caters for all stakeholders and takes into account uh, the nuances of uh, the subsectors of, of our industry. With your permission, Chair, I'd like to turn off my camera for the remainder of the presentation. Is that all right with you? I'm comfortable with that. Thank you very much. I will now uh, project uh, our slides. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. Chair, are you able to see my presentation? Could you just confirm for me? Yes, so we can see the presentation. Perfect. Once more, thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to talk to you today about the copyrights and performance bills and their relevance to Netflix and our creative partners. Uh, we really do trust that you will find our inputs helpful. We've been following the process for a number of years now, um, watching the, the development, the public participatory developments, and we've participated at every platform that has been made available to us. We are very concerned about the negative impact that these bills will have on the AV industry, our future activity in South Africa, and the investments that we have made um, in South Africa. Chair, we must emphasize that while we have concerns about the bills, we, the context of our submission this afternoon is that we support the objectives of the bills. In particular, we support the objective of South Africa aligning with its international obligations and indeed the principles of fair compensation. So today in our presentation, we aim to provide you with our, our perspective through a global lens as well as, to, as well as with the view of continuing our investment into the growth of the creative economy in South Africa. 
So Chair, I will begin by providing you with an overview of our activities in South Africa since the, our launch in 2016, and the investments that we have made into the creative community. After which Brad will provide our views on the bills as well as what we propose as solutions. We would then be happy to take any questions after that. Um, this is just the sequence of our presentation as I've just mentioned. So for those who may not be, oh, sorry, Chase, someone saying something? No, no. Okay. no the, the floor. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Um, Chair, for those who may not be um, aware what or who Netflix is, just a brief introduction of who we are and what it is that we, that we do. And we're just going to play a short video for you. Best interest to involve Africa and African content in what they do right now. I accept the challenge. Thank you. You always create content with the hope. The first Netflix original series from Africa. I was just trying to get your attention. I'm okay. I guess it worked. Content and what they do. Accept the challenge. Thank you. You always create content with the hopes that it will reach the world. Once I put my mind to something, I get it done. For us to be together in one space and being the ones in charge of everything, really, it's incredibly special. I had a full that did okay. When it got onto Netflix, it streamed to millions of people. Like, it was like blown away. He gets things done. To know that my work is going to be on that screen, received by 190 plus countries in the world, that's amazing. Yeah. It's putting African talent on the pedestal. It really deserves to be on. You are black. You are beautiful. And the world needs to see it. That's where we belong. Take one. We know that the talent is here. It's extraordinary, extraordinary talent, especially black creatives. I think it's about time that the world gets to see it. It is time to talk about how it is that we share our value with the world and for us to take ownership. It's just going to open up viewpoints about what Africa really is. Sometimes you just get a feeling that you're part of this place, not a visitor. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. South Africa is alive with possibilities. Lots of possibilities. I South Africans local as Lekker. Comedy scene is very big for us. I like soapies. We like our soapies. Television. Hey. We love singing and dancing. Formula One. TV is my life. Movie nights in the comfort of your own home. How many carrots is this? It's a lot. We communicate with every fiber of our being. We use our bodies, we use our minds. Wait, 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 wait. Did, did I make this all up in my head? You know, to see all these really talented individuals come together and represent what they do, that's cool to see that in practice. This is about African excellence. We might not be the originals, but we are family. We have the voice. Yeah, to represent who we are. We're close to something. We just need to connect the dots. We've been working with talented people for decades. That's powerful. To artistically be the representation of South Africa itself. It's incredible. You will think you're going to watch only two episodes. Uh -uh. Wake up at episode number 10. This sound is hypnotic. <laughs>
Che, can you confirm that you can hear me again? Yes, we can hear you, Zianda. But we are muted now. Zianda? Can you hear me now, Che? Yes, yes, yes. You had muted yourself. Okay, thank you. Right. So Che, che in a nutshell, that is who we are, that video represents it, who we are and what we're doing in, in South Africa. Netflix is a streaming service with 230 members operating in 190 countries, enjoying TV series, documentary and feature films across a wide variety of genres and languages. We launched in South Africa in 2016, and we have built an audience globally and in South Africa by finding and creating the best stories, working with local partners to give our members more options for watching local content. Our business model chair is members, our members, our audience can choose what they want to watch and watch as much as they want, anytime, anywhere, and on any connected, on internet, any internet connected device without any, any commitments. Chair, when we work um, in a particular country in South Africa, we believe in making content for local audiences. When we invest locally, we do not seek to make global shows. The goal is, is local authenticity. That means local voices, local crew, local creators and talent telling South African stories in a South African way. So what have we been up to in South Africa? I'll now talk a bit about our investments since we arrived in 2016. Since we entered the market in 2016, our service has grown and we are very optimistic and excited about the prospects of the service going forward. We believe that key to our growth locally has been the investments that we have made into the local ecosystem. We are doing our best to be part of the solution and to be part of the local creative community, working with our local partners. For example, we are proud to share on this forum the following inv investment milestones since we arrived in South Africa. To date, we have invested over 2 billion into local content. At the, South Af at the 2022 investment conference, which is hosted every year by His Excellency President Ramaphosa, we pledged to invest 920 million into the local economy during the years 2022 and 2023. This 920 million, this commitment is to cover four productions, one international and three local to be filmed in South Africa. Chair, we really believe that our investment story is closely aligned to the socioeconomic priorities of South Africa. For example, Project Panda, which is our biggest production in, in, in Africa to date, which had a production budget of 1.2 billion, we were able to achieve the following. We spent 721 million procuring various goods and services from over 600 uh, SMMEs. As we know, SMMEs have been repeatedly identified as the source of, of job creation in South Africa. Indeed, the National Development Plan of South Africa submits that small and medium businesses will create 90% of new jobs by 2020, 20, 2030. During the course of filming Project Panda, we were able to create 1,000 jobs for mostly young people under the age of 36. As we know, the scourge of unemployment in South Africa is most acute in this demographic. We also care about training young people. Therefore, in Project Panda, we, we had a training budget of 7.6 million, which benefited 30 creators. Chair, we're proud to note that on the Netflix platform, we have over 100 South African titles. In 2022 alone, we launched 12 local titles and in the process created 1,800 jobs for creatives. What we've learned through working in South Africa since 2016 is that our projects do not only benefit the film industry as ordinarily um, understood. We've learned that two thirds of our production budget has a multiplier effect into a long list of other industries connected to the production industry. For example, on our production sets like Project Panda, you would find hairdressers, you would find makeup artists, 
we involve construction companies in our work, we involve transport companies, and we typically require the, the, the services of the hospitality industry. I think I've spoken to the slide, so I'll, I'll move on. Chair, we're, we also just want to, to celebrate the fact that South African content is very, very popular. We have seen that um, the South African content travels very, very far. It finds affinity in a lot of countries and there is a real thirst for, for, for our content in, in our global membership. In cooperation with our local producer partners, we've created local content which is globally competitive and finds affinity beyond the borders of South Africa. What the slide says, Chair, is that in, in, in 2022, 75% of viewing of local content was outside of South Africa. This illustrates that there's a demand for South African content within our global membership. This assists local producers and the actors that we work with to showcase their work on a global stage and positions them for further opportunities and success. Silverton Siege, a film inspired by a real life South, Africa, by a real life South African story, was on the top 10 most watched lists in 80 countries for two weeks straight. As a South African, I was really, really proud of that film. In a 2021 survey conducted in partnership with SA Tourism, we were able to establish that South African content available on our platform creates a strong affinity with South Africa and potentially drives tourism and feeds into the country. And at this stage, Chair, I then hand over to Brad to talk about our concerns on, the, on, on specific proposals in the bills and what we propose as corresponding solutions. Thank you. Thanks, Yanda, and thank you, Chair. So the bills have stoked a great deal of passion. Some of these, some people look at these bills and they see hope. They see hope that the bills will usher in a new era, facilitating digital uses, access for the visually impaired, and improving the, the position of creators. Others have looked at these bills and they have spoken of disaster for the creative sector. They've seen a law that will enable overly broad uses that deprive creators of remuneration. They see a law that doesn't take into account the differences between the subsectors and what each of those need to survive from a practical perspective. They have said that they believe that if this law is enacted, the future of South Africa's creative economy will be damaged. And yet everyone seems to agree that updating copyright law for the digital age is now due and that the law should definitely protect the interests of authors and performers but there is disagreement about whether the bills can and do actually accomplish this. Netflix joins the consensus in supporting the goals behind the bills. The outcome of this process is very important to us, not merely because we invest in the sector as Yanda has just spoken about, it's because of how we work, which is hand in hand with South African producers, actors, writers, directors, cinematographers, editors, and many more to make authentically local South African TV shows and films for local and global audiences. What this means is that we very much depend on a thriving local creative sector in order to develop and produce the best stories. If the local sector doesn't thrive, then neither can we, and neither can our local and global peers. Our future success in South Africa is bound with that of the SMEs and individual creators who help produce amazing content. If their future prospects are harmed, then so will ours be harmed. The welfare of creators and the welfare of the broader sector are similarly bound together. Given the various views on the bills, it almost seems as if there's some acceptance that the result is going to produce some winners and some losers. And we disagree with that paradigm. If the bills are going to achieve their purpose, then the sector as a whole must benefit and grow. If the bills are an obstacle to sector growth, then all the protections for creators will be for nothing. So we address the committee today to help answer these questions. Do these bills actually work? Will they accomplish what they set out to do? Can they support a thriving creative sector which retains incentives for investment and is also equitable? 
Now, as you know, Netflix produces content in multiple countries, both directly and in partnership with local creators. We therefore have to navigate multiple legal frameworks at the center of which is copyright. From my own personal experience as a WITS graduate and I had practiced in the field of copyright in South Africa for several years before I moved to New York where I've been focused on global IP policy for the last 20 years, most recently at Netflix, my day-to-day -day specifically allows me to focus globally on different copyright frameworks around the world, which helps inform a viewpoint about how the enactment of the bills might position South Africa as a in the context of their copyright frameworks. The more difficult the bills make it to produce and distribute content, the more likely it will be that investment is going to be diverted to countries which do not have those barriers. Chair and committee members, if enacted in their current form, the bills will make producing and distributing audiovisual content in South Africa difficult, complicated, and risky. And this will impede the operation and growth of the sector, which will in turn damage the interests and welfare of individual creators who cannot earn a living unless there are productions for them to work on. We note that a substantial number of other stakeholders have shared these views and submitted them to this committee from as broad a perspective as international and local audiovisual producers, individual creators, collective management organizations, legal practitioners, publishers, music recording companies, animation producers, commercial producers, academics, and more. Next slide, please. It's clear that the bills have failed to consider the specific characteristics of the AV sector. Producing TV shows and films, as, you, as you've heard, is a high-risk activity because we don't know what's going to succeed and what will fail. And unfortunately, many do fail because we can't predict success. That's why most producers need to balance these risks by investing in a slate of projects. But before there can be any investment, before any production can even get off the ground, three things need to be present. A producer must be able to obtain and consolidate the rights necessary to enable them to commercialize an audiovisual work for an appropriate term. There also needs to be legal certainty so that the parties can create agreements and rely on a stable framework to give meaning to them. There's a need as well for contractual flexibility so that parties can choose terms for each production that fit the context of that production. And if you eliminate one or more of these elements, then the sustainability of the production ecosystem is going to be jeopardized. We focus on four areas of the bills that in fact undermine these foundational elements, namely the mandatory royalty, the limitation on assignment, the reporting obligation and the ministerial power to set contractual terms. Regarding royalties, which the bills define as a share of revenue, for some reason, this is optional for authors. They can agree on another form of remuneration, but is made mandatory for performers. They are given no choice. The law decides for performers that this is the form of remuneration, a share of revenue that they must be paid, and they cannot opt out of this form of payment. Netflix supports fair remuneration for both authors and performers, but this should not be pursuant to a one-size-fits-all model, not to mention a royalty obligation model, which is not compatible with the nature of the AV sector, nor in the best interest of creators. Let us explain to you a few reasons why. Firstly, in the audiovisual sector, the norm is for authors and performers to get paid upfront. This is because Producers need to define their budget for these upfront costs because of the risky nature of the business so that they can bear that risk of the inevitable number of losses that may lie ahead. Since most productions may even fail to recoup their initial investments, creators benefit from this upfront payment because they get paid regardless of whether or not there is a profit for the producer or any other third party that obtains the rights down the line. Now, the bills step in and they disrupt this. They say royalties are the only way that, 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 that performers should be paid. This might mean that producers, in the face of uncertainty and future responsibility to pay royalties, even if they're making a loss, might even decide to reduce or eliminate this upfront payment. As we know, many creators depend on upfront payments 
to ensure stable income, but the bills threaten to take away this choice. This is very different from our other countries approach this issue. Many countries have enshrined protections for performers and authors through equitable remuneration, but they have not done so through sacrificing flexibility and certainty for stakeholders in the way that these bills will do. We note that the copyright amendment bill in focusing solely on royalties and its likely inclusion of performers who are so-called extras is also inconsistent with the Beijing Audiovisual Performers Treaty. The concept of royalties for these reasons is highly exceptional in the audiovisual sector, despite what you might have heard. The way that royalties are defined in the bills as a share of revenue is virtually unprecedented in any other copyright regime in our experience. Now, royalties is a term that is used very broadly sometimes, but specifically, it's a term that's much more common in the context of the music sector. But this is not the case for audiovisual works. It is not the case in Europe. It is not the case in the US, Latin America, or Asia, that the law provides for performers and authors to get a percentage of revenue. It is highly unusual. It seems that the bills also assume that it's possible to even ascribe revenue to each individual TV show or film. But in the context of models like subscription video on demand or pay TV, this is not the case. Subscribers don't pay a separate fee for each show that they watch. Membership fees don't in fact correlate with revenue for individual films and TV shows. So the concept of royalties as the bills envisage it is actually incompatible with these forms of distribution. I mention this because a comprehensive socioeconomic impact study would have identified this incongruency between what the bills propose and how a major part of the creative sector actually works. Ultimately, what happens is the bills tie the hands of both producers, distributors, and performers in a way that in fact narrow the options for finding flexible and sustainable means to achieve equitable remuneration. We therefore strongly request that Section 8A of the Copyright Amendment Bill be deleted and that remuneration for performers be addressed in the context of the Performance Protection Bill in a way that doesn't impose a narrow one-size-fits-all solution, which is unsuitable for the creative sector and the AV sector in particular. In our submission, we also go into more detail about uh, other solutions which um, other jurisdictions have applied towards this end, which are more flexible. Next slide, please. The bills also prevent authors and performers from assigning their rights for the full term of copyright and, said, say, and instead say to them, you may only assign your copyright for 25 years. What does this mean in practice? It means that producers cannot acquire full assignments. They cannot consolidate all the rights necessary in order to commercialize a film for an appropriate term. It means that in practice, all South African content potentially could have an expiry date after 25 years, unless all the underlying rights can be recleared. And I know that other stakeholders uh, and, and, and in other submissions, the point has been made that it is quite unlikely that you are going to be able to go back to every single author that contributed to the production and be able to negotiate for an extension. There are many obstacles towards doing this from resources to practical obstacles, or even just the unwillingness of even one single performer to say, or author to say, we don't want to renegotiate this. And that means that the content will cease to be available. So looking ahead in 25 years, what's gonna happen? Will most South African content simply disappear from public view because of these practical impossibilities to go back to every author? Think about the films and TV series that are now older than 25 years. Had the bills been an application at that time, I question whether or not films like Sarafina, Cry the Beloved Country, Have You Seen Drum Lately, Mapansula, A Dry White Season, films that are about the legacy and history and cultural identity of South Africa may in fact not be available right now. In practical terms, the bills may create a cliff for South African content, and that would be truly a tragedy if they might become unavailable for the next generation. This isn't just a problem for today's investor, for, 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 for the future. It's also a problem for today's investor 
who's only going to be able to obtain limited rights. And it's a problem for today's authors who won't be able to freely bargain for the full term of their rights. This means that the subject of the transaction is going to be smaller because the law says it has to be smaller. You can't bargain for the full value of what the law has provided you as a copyright owner and as an author. And therefore, what is being negotiated for may be less valuable, which means that there is less money being exchanged. Again, there are other options for ensuring that authors and performers get fair value for their contributions, which could address these concerns in a way that don't result in the deprivation of access to content, history, and culture for the next generation. Next slide, please. Regarding the reporting obligation, it's been mentioned as well today that this is a potentially massive and burdensome obligation, given the multiple millions of ways that works are being used every single day in both the analog and the digital environment. So the question of how this may actually be complied with is a serious question which, for which I don't think there is an answer at the moment. Even looking past practical compliance, we do have some data about how much it will cost to set up a reporting system based on studies that have done in Germany and the Netherlands, which looked at the European copyright framework, which requires a much narrower form of reporting. Their data shows that setting up a system initially is going to run into millions of euros, which will mean that most small and medium-sized companies are just not going to be able to afford this. So this obligation and associated sanction is well outside the global norm. And I'm concerned that it's going to create a chilling effect on the market and being disproportionate to the intended goals. Millions of rands are being at risk, are at risk of being diverted from investment in content, not to mention the lost opportunities because of those who might be deterred completely from entering the market because the risk of a massive fine, which is a minimum, of 10% of turnover, which is disproportionate to other kinds of, uh, of wrongdoings which the law uh, is concerned with, or even a prison sentence. Um, I've heard directly from individual producers who are really afraid of the threat of a potential jail sentence as being something that they may weigh against, against, uh, uh, may weigh against entering into the sector to do future production. Next, next slide, please. And perhaps most concerning of all, given its breadth, is the provision granting the minister to set contractual terms for agreements between authors, performers, and third parties. From our perspective, we've, not, we've never seen a, a provision that grants such power with the potential to completely upend the investment horizon for audiovisual content. Budgets and forecasts need to be planned well in advance, years in advance, but with a shadow of regulation at the will of the minister, which could completely alter the terms of future agreements, which would remove flexibility and the ability to manage risk. The question is, how do you make future plans with such a huge cloud of uncertainty? Next slide, please. These bills are going to shape the future of the creative sector. They're ambitious instruments seeking to bridge the gap between a past, which has seen some achieve greatness and wealth while others have struggled. So the stakes are high, but the good intentions behind these bills are not enough to ensure their success. These are technical instruments and they ambitiously seek to impose a complex paradigm on an already risky environment. It's important, of course, to listen to those who seek to improve their positions under these bills, who come at this honestly. But it's also important to listen to those who have said these bills will take away the fundamental pillars for what the sector actually needs to survive and to thrive. As we've mentioned, there are solutions that can meet both needs, but these solutions are not in the bills. We describe a number of these alternatives in our submission, and we really hope that the committee will consider them. We hope that the South African copyright framework will not become an outlier which deters investment. South African creators have incredible stories to tell and share with local and global audiences and we at Netflix remain committed to working with them to help achieve that. We also stand ready to share our experience to find solutions that can achieve the values and the goals of the bulls without jeopardizing the welfare of the sector, including creators. We're excited about the opportunities ahead and growing our partnerships with South African creators. 
and hope that the concerns that we and many others have expressed to you will be considered and addressed as you face this important task of deciding the fate of the sector. Thank you, Chair. We would now um, be happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Silva, Bradley Silva, for the for the uh, presentation that was led also by Ms. Yanda. Uh, let me check from the platform whether there's any clarity seeking questions that members would want to raise. Any clarity seeking questions? Uh, looks like looks like we are quite clear in terms of uh, highlighting uh, your issues, uh, Mr. Bradley. Uh, on our on, 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 on your views on the royalties, your views on the on the uh, twenty five year version, the uh, reporting obligations which. Uh, uh, you are quite categorical, so they are onerous, and also the uh, the uh, uh, rigidity in terms of uh, uh, ministerial powers. Uh, but I think uh, what, what, what gives us comfort is the it's it's it's, 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 it's your last it's your last point or your last uh, uh, appreciation of the the environment. Uh, which build on, builds on the point that was raised earlier on by by Zianda when she sketched when she sketched the the uh, in, uh, investment environment opportunities uh, associated with the production of Netflix and its growth, uh, but also uh, the uh, the good intention and uh, what has to be done to be able to balance the two. I think that is the issue that is coming out quite clear. And uh, you have really helped us in terms of sketching those issues. Uh, and uh, we agree uh, that uh, it is a contested terrain. Uh, hence the public views, public hearing, public consultation that will ultimately shape the, the, the final product that will be adopted by the, by the National Council of Province. And on that note, let me take this opportunity to extend a word of gratitude to your effort in honoring our invite uh, as, uh, on behalf of Netflix, uh, and have a wonderful afternoon, yourself, Bradley and Zianda. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for having us. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, Zianda. Uh, let's, uh, let's get a sense from Grace uh, in terms of the next uh, presenters. Uh, it will be uh, Amazon. Uh, which will be led by uh, Ms. Annie Kern and also Ms. Lindy Wunder. Uh, the floor is theirs on behalf of Amazon. Are they on the floor, uh, Grace? Yes, we're here. Thank you. Oh, oh good. The floor is yours. Good yes. afternoon. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for this invitation to speak before the Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members of the Select Committee on behalf of Amazon Studios and Prime Video. We so appreciate this opportunity to share our thoughts on the Copyright Amendment Bill and the Performers Protection Amendment Bill. My name is Ann Kang and I'm a principal with Amazon's Economic Development Policy for Amazon Studios and Prime Video. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Lindy Vundla, who is Senior Corporate Counsel and Amazon's Head of Legal for Sub-Saharan Africa. In South Africa, Amazon currently has over 7,000 employees across a variety of business lines. In 2019, Amazon Web Services launched the AWS Equity Equivalent Investment Program in South Africa as part of the country's Broad-Based Black and Economic Empowerment Program, or Triple BEE. As of December 2020, AWS attained a level one triple BEE certificate. The AWS Equity Equivalent Investment Program plans to invest more than 365 million rands towards developing 100% black owned local small businesses in the information and communication technology sector from 2020 to December, 2026. I will now shift the focus of our presentation today, Amazon Studios and Prime Video. 
Amazon Studios is a home for talent. We create and produce original films and television series for global audiences. Original series premiere exclusively on Prime Video, which is available in more than 240 countries and territories around the world. Amazon Studios also produces and acquires original movies for theatrical release, as well as exclusively for Prime Video. We also produce original content for Freebie, our premium free streaming service. In South Africa, Amazon Studios recently started building a local team to oversee development of local original titles. And we're working together with talented South African creators who are hard at work to deliver authentic, premium, and beloved hit scripted and unscripted series and movies to our local and global audiences. And local content is a key component of our content strategy in South Africa. And our investments in 2023 will continue to reflect that. We're actively in discussions with local producers to fill our slate with a wide range of films and series that'll further bolster our catalog of South African tech content. South Africa is an attractive filming destination for Amazon Studios international films and series, including our originals, such as sci-fi scripted series, The Power, and the film My Spy 2. We're continually looking for opportunities to bring international productions to South Africa. And Prime Video South Africa officially launched in December 2016. And since then, Prime Video has licensed over 150 local South African titles from producers and distributors, as well as the SABC, The Umbrella Men, Zulu Wedding, The Domestic, Margarin, Promises, Deepu, Vanderloos, Five Fingers from Marseille, Knuckle City, Of Good Report, Losing Lorato, and more. So I'd like to speak now a little bit about the economic impact of the audiovisual industry globally and specifically in South Africa. Screen production is a very significant economic and strategic sector around the world. And there's been an unprecedented increase in content investment in recent years. And that's been underpinned by global consumer demand and it's been driven by new and established producers. This has led to an estimated $238 billion in global content spend last year. Like other sectors, the screen sector, however, is facing economic pressures, but growth is still predicted, including sizable expansion in Africa overall. Video on demand services, uh, subscriptions in Africa are forecast to reach 13.7 million in 2027. This is an increase of four point, from 4.89 million at the end of 2021. Revenues are also forecast to triple from $623 million in 2021 to $2 billion in 2027. And screen production expenditure gives provides a range of strong economic benefits across a range of metrics such as output, gross value added, and the creation of jobs. And production activity in the sector also creates unique strategic value in terms of the type and range of employment that's created, such as, as well as the impact of the sector on areas like soft power, as well as national branding and tourism as well. Many governments have responded to this opportunity with strategies and policy interventions to stimulate both domestic and inward screen production, because there's a recognition that there's positive interplay between the two sectors. And this is especially important for South Africa, where local screen content is a key contributor to predicted growth. And South Africa is a highly competitive, internationally renowned production hub. But competition has increased because other jurisdictions are waking up and they want to develop and improve. South Africa, however, is still a leading destination for production activity on the continent with a very experienced below the line workforce and talent base. The country has a robust production services and facilitation infrastructure to support and sustain continual flow of international productions. And these projects contribute to skills development and growth of resources within the sector. And this in turn feeds the development of South Africa's domestic industry. And broadcasting has long been the heartbeat of the local production industry in South Africa. And this industry has been enhanced through the growth of international productions in the country. And the scope and the wide range of international productions result in key opportunities for new talent in the sector to develop digital skills and experience because so many domestic productions pull from this established pool of, of existing talent. South African productions 
with support from international production companies and distribution services, have gone on to garner wide international acclaim. And the sector in the country has significant economic benefits, as it was noted in a National Film and Video Foundation report that covered April 2016 to March 2021. On average, one rand of expenditure generated an additional 2.82 rand of additional income in the wider economy. An inward investment is, is critical to continue to sustain the current level of production and growth in the country. And in addition to creating economic benefits for the industry and other sectors, it's a very dependable source of work that provides opportunity for skills enhancements and platforms for career pathways for both cast and crew. I will now pass it over to my colleague, Lindy, who will discuss the legal impacts of the bills. Good afternoon, honorable chairperson and honorable members. In today's presentation, as we look at the legal implications of the bill, we would like to focus on those aspects of the Copyright Amendment Bill and the Performance Protection Amendment Bill that we think requires further consideration by this committee. Firstly, and very importantly, we understand and support the primary objective behind the amendments made to the bills, which is to ensure that authors and performers are equitably remunerated for their copyright works and are subject to fair contractual terms. However, we're concerned that certain provisions in the bills might not necessarily, necessarily result in these outcomes and might in fact have the opposite effect of disadvantaging the very people that these bills aim to protect. So there are four main concerns with us with respect to the bills that we would like to take you through. Firstly, under royalties, the requirement of the Copyright Amendment Bill that all authors and performers are paid a share of royalties received by the copyright owner for their copyright works in perpetuity. Some of these concerns include the requirement that the payment of royalties to performers and authors must be in a certain manner and form. And secondly, the contractual override in the new section 39 of the Copyright Amendment Bill that renders unenforceable any waiver or renouncement of any right of protection in the Copyright Amendment Bill. Secondly, we would like to turn to the registration requirements as set out in the bill, um, where the requirements in respect of copyright works and the imposition of significant criminal sanctions for failure to comply. Thirdly, we'd like to touch on the reversion rights. Um, the prevention of authors of literary and musical works and performers from licensing or assigning their rights for longer than 25 years. And lastly, we'd like to touch on the extraterritorial um, application of the Act, Section 3.1 of the Copyright Act, which has not been amended by the Amendment Bill, applies the above concerns that we are going to discuss extraterritorially to South African citizens and residents working outside of South Africa. Each of these concerns individually is problematic and all of them collectively create a brick disincentive for international studios such as ours to film in South Africa and to hire South African talent for international projects. We will deal with each of these in turn in a bit more detail and also highlight global industry norms relating to each of these concerns and how the global norms are very different from the proposals that we have in our bills. Just turning to the first concern, which is, which is, the, which is the royalty share, as mentioned before, and it, it bears emphasizing, um, we respect and join in the belief that performers and authors should be the royalties are set out might not have the intended effect. We agree with other submissions that have been made that the copyright amendment will eliminate the ability of authors and performers to independently determine the nature of their remuneration. According to the Copyright Amendment Bill, only one form of remuneration is possible. This is further restricted by the so-called contractual override position. We fully appreciate that the Minister of Trade and Industry may be granted certain powers to regulate the industry. But the power granted to the minister to prescribe the manner and form of all agreements for the payment of royalties to performers and authors severely limits the contracting party's freedom to contract. 
Indeed, we are not aware of any other jurisdictions globally where a government official is mandated to prescribe terms and con conditions of an intellectual property agreement between private parties. And my colleague Anne will touch on other um, global industry practices a bit later on. The combination of all these factors has the impact of eliminating the ability to establish commercial production options and to determine remuneration options models that are most suitable to a film or TV series production.